to be able to get through this presentation. My name is Gail Neal, I'm from Ulster University and thanks very much for coming along. As Paula says, th this aspect of the presentation will be recorded and, and in this aspect I'll give a bit of background and context to trans in Northern Ireland society. Siobhan will then present some of the data and then we'll look at kind of lessons learned from doing this and going forward and then we'll turn off the recording and we can have some more of a discussion and some Q&A around that. So while part of the LGBT acronym, the T has often been overlooked or more generally subsumed within discourse research and services. As such, the focus has primarily been on sexual identity, LGB, rather than gender identity, T. Therefore, when we talk about LGBT, this hasn't always been reflective of transgender individuals' interests and topics. This briefing, therefore, seeks to explicitly focus on gender identity, reporting on public attitudes <coughs> in Northern Ireland towards transgender people. And I suppose it's at this point where I do a disclaimer, and that is what we can and can't do with the data that's presented. What survey data allows us to do is provide you an insight into self-reported attitudes towards transgender people accessing rights. So that's what the survey data allows us to do. What it doesn't allow us to do, however, is to provide an insight into the experiences of transgender individuals within society. And this is really significant and worth pointing out at the outset today, because as you'll see as we go throughout the presentation, public attitudes towards transgender people may appear to be somewhat out of sync with the experiences of transgender people themselves and what research tells us on that front. So it's about setting the parameters of what the survey data can and can't do uh, in terms of what we're presenting today. It's really helpful, therefore, to have a number of LGB and T organisations here today who are in a position to talk to the everyday experiences of transgender people living in Northern Ireland. Like I said, the survey data speaks only to self-reported levels of prejudice within the general population. In recent times, we've witnessed unprecedented levels of interest in matter of gender and sexuality and diversity. The historic framing of sex within medicine and biology is now supplemented with less fixed contemporary perspectives on gender identity. As such, Monroe and Warren note that transgender identities are complex and contested even within the transgender community. There's no consistent definition, but rather what Pierce refers to as fragmented pathways to trans becomings. In other words, as some activist groups claims, there's no one way to be trans. More often or not, therefore, we start to see general definitions such as this being used to try and capture the broad range of identities and gender presentations that fall under a trans umbrella. Language and understanding about gender and identity is constantly evolving, however. So while definitions such as this aim to be inclusive of diverse identities, we know that there's a use of a whole host of other range of, of labels to try and capture other diverse identities under this umbrella. Trans, transsexual, queer, non-binary, all being used by individuals. And at times this can be very deliberate and a very political claiming of one's identity. And at other times it can just be the simple um, interchangeable use of labels. In short, we recognise that labels are laden with multiple meanings for people. We are deliberate, therefore, in our use of the language of transgender throughout the presentation today, as that is the language of the survey and the questions that were based around that. We'll also reference T throughout, um, the missing T, the name of the, the paper, and this speaks to a missing grouping within the wider LGBT grouping, rather than a, a kind of a lazy shorthand. So we hope you appreciate and understand that when we reference T throughout, that that's where that's coming from. Like I said, the name of the paper is The Missing T, and while we stand by that, and hopefully that will become really clear as we go throughout the presentation, um, it might be argued that if you've been watching social media or watching the TV or, or things like that over the last while, that rather than it being missing, that actually the T is exploding on television and social media for a number of different <coughs> reasons. But I suppose just because we've had a flurry of activity in the last year or so doesn't mean that trans has always been to the forefront. So I want to start um, by thinking about that missing T. As previously mentioned, the T was often sidelined or absent within LGBT organisations. Ruth Hunt, who was the CEO of the LGBT charity Stonewall, commented that they were late to the game 
in supporting the trans community. Similarly, within research, that which claimed to be LGBT in focus, um, again, often sidelined the experiences of trans people by having really small trans subsamples or not having trans within the sample at all, but claiming it to be LGBT, or presenting material in a way that you couldn't distinguish um, between sexual identities and gender identities. And while LGB people share some of the experiences um, of um, trans people in terms of minority identities, we do recognize that there are different experiences there as well, and that those need to be specifically um, identified uh, and called out. So the missing T then leads us on to an increased focus on T and a recognition from within the LGBT sector that there are specific inequalities and experiences of trans individuals that need to be addressed. But the increased focus on T has also resulted um, because of grassroots trans activists who are increasingly speaking out about inequalities facing trans individuals. And while this increased focus has been useful in informing public attitudes or speaking out about continued inequalities or calling for the extension of legal protections for trans individuals, um, it's also been used at times to fuel public panic with the rights of transgender people being set against or pitted against the rights of the non-transgender population. And this has been exemplified in high recent and, and, and high profile recent debates around the use of toilets, transgender women accessing domestic violence refuges, gender self-identification, and trans women within competitive sports. So it might be helpful for a moment just to consider the way in which the public are informed around issues of, of trans and transgender in, in contemporary society. Some of you will be more um, aware of some of these storylines than others, but on the top right-hand side, we see Caitlyn Jenner and Laverne Cox, high-profile American celebrities um, who are both transgender. Um, so we see a very glamorized, a very sexualized presentation of a trans, ide a trans identity. There's a whole host, however, of other graphic headlines that could be used to highlight the media's fixation with how the body is changed through medicine or through surgery or, or, or through other, or other ways. And actually the stories of Caitlyn Jenner and Laverne Cox focusing increasingly on gender reassignment surgery, who they're dating, and storylines like that. Within general entertainment, this kind of middle column, we start to see a witness, uh, witness an increase of transgender storylines within Coronation Street, EastEnders, docu-soaps like My Transsexual Summer, the television programme Butterfly. Such portrayals of transgender people bring uh, this into everyday life, perhaps in a way that's la less glamorised. Um, however, some would argue that this um, actually can fuel uh, public panic and concern as well because the likes of the, the, the Butterfly programme, you know, um, focusing on transitioning of children and again this being used to, to fuel a panic amongst the general population. Other high profile stories just this week um, saw LGBT ambassador um, for Childline, Monroe Bergdorf, a trans activist and model being publicly removed from this model from this role after social media pressurized um, uh, the, the NSPCC about the, the appropriateness of this um, person as a, as a spokesperson um, for, for their organisation. Other ways in which trans um, has been brought to public consciousness perhaps has been through the consultation on the Gender Recognition Act in England and Wales and this has been significant in increasing public knowledge um, around transgender rights and access. More often or not, like I said, this has been used to pit the, the rights and experiences of one group off another and these conversations have quickly become um, focused on questions of self-identification um, and the use of toilets, refuges and prisons. We've also seen the reclassification of transgender within the World Health Organization, previ previously listed within the mental health chapter. Gender incongruence, as it's now being referred to, has been moved to the sexual health chapter as a result of increased understanding about trans identities, but also because of an awareness of the previous classification and the stigma that this caused. So while stories like this, like I say, have brought transgender people and trans um, 
related issues and access to public consciousness, um, such media attention has also fueled a panic. And we've seen that in terms of this them and us, issues of safety, the rights of one group over another. And it's in light of these often contradictory ways in which public attitudes and debates on issues are presented that this research update provides an overview of contemporary public attitudes in Northern Ireland. That's by way of a very long introduction <laughs> to, the, to the data. Um, but we'll go on to present some of that now. So, given what I said about the discussion around the increasingly diverse identities presented under a transgender umbrella, defining transgender in a way that the general public can understand poses particular challenges for survey data. Survey research requires definitions and questions that are understandable to a broad audience. It's difficult, therefore, to ask um, questions that would fully reflect the variance of gender identities. In an attempt to provide direct comparison with the rest of the UK, the 2018 Northern Ireland Life and Times survey utilised some of the definitions and questions used in the 2016 British Social Attitude Survey. These adapted the language of gender identity questions previously developed and tested with groups of trans and non-trans people. And while there are still limitations to the questions and the definitions, this actually helps provide a baseline uh, for Northern Ireland attitudes that we can compare against in the future. The British Social Attitudes Survey and the Northern Ireland Life and Times Survey use the following definition. People who are tra transgender have gone through all or part of a process, including thoughts or actions, to change the sex they were described as at birth to the gender they identify with or intend to. This might include by changing their name, wearing different clothes, taking hormones or having gender reassignment surgery. <coughs> So like I say, despite some of the limitations with definition and how those questions are, are asked to the general public, uh, we nonetheless argue that this is really important to start to track public attitudes and Siobhan's now going to go through uh, some of that with us. Okay, so, um, so what I want to do now is present some of the data, and now Gail's given a bit of the background. Um, so some of the data from the survey on public attitudes towards transgender people. And in doing that, what I also want to try and do is illustrate why it's actually important to ask specific questions about public attitudes towards transgender people. So we're doing this through a kind of notion of five reasons why. We might have borrowed the notion of five, not quite 12 reasons uh, from elsewhere, but try, to try and frame this discussion again to reveal what we can actually uh, kind of find out about public attitudes if we ask very specific questions about transgender rather than LGBT and uh, kind of clump issues together. So, of course, as Gail has already alluded to, the first reason why we should ask specific questions about attitudes towards transgender people is because we haven't done so before. As Paula says at the beginning, the Northern Ireland Life and Times Survey has asked some questions in the past about public perceptions about inequality towards different groups, including transgender people, but it hasn't asked specific questions about public attitudes themselves towards transgender people and transgender issues. So the point is that we need to make the questions explicit if we actually want to find out really what people think or what people think they think. Um, so the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey has, for example, um, asked questions in the past about attitudes towards LGB people and attitudes towards LGB rights. And that's really important because what we've been able to do through that data is to track over time changes in attitudes and patterns in attitudes. And the assumption often is then that those attitudes extend to the transgender population. But the fact is we actually don't know. So despite the fact that the data shows that attitudes towards LGB people have become more accepting within Northern Ireland, we don't know if this extends to transgender people. So utilising the definition that Gail uh, presented at the beginning there, survey respondents were asked to rate their level of prejudice towards people who are transgender. And this is what the results show. So again, we're thinking about the question that people are asked to rate their own level of prejudice. So seven out of 10 respondents, 72% of respondents des described themselves as not prejudiced at all, while 21% expressed some level of prejudice. They said they were either very prejudiced or a little prejudiced. 
So there's a couple of things here. Firstly, to note that the British Social Attitudes Survey asked exactly the same question, <laughs> and they had higher levels of people um, uh, defining themselves as not prejudiced than the Northern Ireland sample. And the other thing I suppose we should say here is that you know, we might be quite sceptical about measures of self-defined prejudice. Um, you know, who, after all, is going to admit their prejudice? Um, or, who, or can we actually even recognise our own prejudice? But I think what is interesting here is, despite that caveat, 21% of people, so still a significant minority of people, do recognise their own prejudice or openly are willing to openly define their own prejudice. So there is value in asking these sorts of questions. What there also is, is there some interesting differences across the sample? And this brings us to our second reason why it's important to ask specific questions. Uh, public attitude surveys allow us to examine how attitudes may vary across a range of demographic factors. So they help us to identify the characteristics of those who do define themselves as prejudice. Um, so, and this is important because, uh, like Gail said at the beginning, despite the fact that the data here might overall show uh, that people um, uh, define themselves as less prejudice, um, the wider evidence does suggest that people who are transgender continue to experience prejudice. Likewise, in 2016, the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey did ask the public, did they think transgender people, along with a, a, a number of other minority groups, did they think they were treated unfairly or unequally? So there is recognition by the public, 48% um, felt that transgender people were treated unfairly in comparison to other groups. So there does tend to be a recognition among the public that transgender people may be treated unfairly, even if individuals themselves don't think that they may be prejudiced. But what then are the characteristics of those people who do openly define themselves as prejudiced towards transgender people? And this is where I find there's uh, you know, really some interesting findings from the data. So these are people who define themselves as either very prejudiced or a little prejudiced. So what we see from the data here, I've tried to highlight the key findings, is that females are less prejudiced than males, that the youngest age group and the oldest age group report more prejudice than the age groups in the middle, the 25 to 54 year olds. Those who identify as belonging to a Catholic religion are less prejudiced than those identify in as belonging to a Protestant religion or as having no religion. And perhaps what is most interesting from this data is that knowing someone, those people who know someone who are tran who's transgender are much less likely to report prejudice than somebody who doesn't know somebody who's transgender. So there's very important messages here in terms of social contact and we see there's almost three times the rate of self-defined prejudice among those who have no social contact with people who are trans uh, transgender um, than those that do. So we may think, OK, some of these findings are not overly surprising. If we look at other attitudinal uh, data, we do often find that women are more accepting than men. Um, other research has also demonstrated that levels of social contact impact on our levels of prejudice of different minority groups. What perhaps is more surprising is some of the data here around age and religion. We might, for example, have expected the youngest age group and those with no religion to be less prejudiced than reported here. Indeed, if we look at Northern Ireland Life and Times data on attitudes towards lesbian, gay and bisexual people and LGB issues, what we see there is that the youngest age group and those with no religion are actually among the groups who have the most positive attitudes. So, this does again demonstrate the importance of asking specific questions about attitudes towards LGB people and attitudes towards uh, transgender people. What I suppose we need to remember here, as Paula said at the beginning, is this is one year's data. More generally, we have data over time and we're able to look for patterns. So we don't know if there's going to be a pattern in this, but I think you know, there's some interesting things uh, to point out here. Okay, so our third reason then for focusing specifically on, uh, on the T or asking individuals attitudes specifically on transgender issues is, as just alluded to there, is that attitudes towards gender identity may actually differ from attitudes towards sexual identity. It's often assumed that if people are, are accepting of LGB people and LGB rights that they're also accepting of trans people and trans rights and vice versa. <coughs> 
And perhaps, as Gail says, we assume this because we haven't got the data to disaggregate this, or we conflate minority gender identities with minority sexual identities. And I suppose it's important to say that while this survey this year didn't ask a specific question to individuals to self-rate their prejudice on LGB identity or LGB people, it did ask questions about LGB issues. So it asked a question about um, acceptance of same-sex relations. So we've taken that almost as our proxy measure for attitudes towards LGB uh, people in order that we can do some level of comparison. And again, there's some interesting findings here. What we found is that across all measures, whether it was age, religious um, uh, identification, gender, church attendance, um, think of some of the other measures, uh, educational level, that we actually find higher levels of non-acceptance of same-sex sexual relations than self-identified prejudice towards transgender people. And if we look at this in a little bit more detail, um, if we compare self-identified prejudice towards transgender people with public attitudes towards same-sex relations and public attitudes towards marriage equality, the differences maybe become a little more evident. Here what we see in this table is that 30%, 38% of people who think that same-sex relations are wrong, so over a third of those who think that same-sex relations are wrong, and 36% of those who don't support marriage equality, again, over a third, define themselves as not prejudiced towards transgender people. So again, what we're seeing here is that a significant proportion of people who maybe may say are not accepting of LGB issues or equality issues do appear accepting of transgender people. So we can't assume then that lack of acceptance of some minority groups or issues equates with lack of acceptance towards other groups. Now, of course, as I said at the beginning, there's a caveat here in terms of the questions. And going forward, it might be more useful to ask exactly the same questions so as we have a, a better reliable comparison here. But again, we see the difference in, 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 in separating our attitudes towards gender minority and uh, sexual minority issues. As Gail said also at the beginning, there's been a number of high profile policy debates uh, regarding trans rights that have received a lot of media coverage. Um, most notably, these have been in terms of access to public toilets, the rights of transgender people to access domestic violence refuges, and the rights to change the sex marker on their birth certificate. And in these stories and sound bites, we're often presented with very emotive and polarised positions. And what we find <coughs> is that often these views and positions are, are, are kind of almost pitted as evidence or symbolic of what public attitudes are. And for us, this is the fourth reason for why it's really important that we collect robust data on public attitudes on these issues. These are the things that we're talking about that are in the media at the moment. Again, another table. So this table presents some of the findings in relation to these questions. So both the BSA, the British Social Attitudes Survey, and the NILT, the Northern Ireland Life and Times uh, Survey, asked identical questions um, about level of, of comfort with transgender people using public toilets and refuges. The question about use of female toilets was asked to females only, and the question about use of male toilets was asked to males only. The question on changing uh, birth certificate was worded slightly differently in both surveys, and I do think that has an impact perhaps in some of the findings. In the Northern Ireland Life and Times survey reflecting the law, um, uh, individuals were asked for their level of approval of transgender people changing their birth certificate after two years of living in their acquired gender. The British Social Attitude Survey, however, asked a much more general question. Uh, they asked more generally about levels of approval of an individual's right to change their birth certificate. So there was no caveat uh, with that. So what we see here, if we look at some of this data, perhaps one of the first things we see, and which is important to point out, is that there are differences in levels of acceptance among the Northern Ireland sample and the British sample. And that's quite evident in some areas uh, more than others. What we also see, however, and perhaps quite surprisingly given the media discourse, is that over half of the sample in Northern Ireland, in relation to every one of the scenarios, said that they are accepting. So that they are comfortable or accepting of trans people accessing public toilets, uh, domestic violence refuges if necessary, and having the right to change their birth certificate. <coughs> 
Now, of course, the important thing to remember is if over half approve or are comfortable, that doesn't mean the other half don't approve or are uncomfortable. Actually, in all scenarios, no more than three in ten people reported that they were uncomfortable or disapproved of these rights uh, for transgender people. So again, just to reiterate that these statistics are important because they demonstrate that attitudes might not be as negative as what we often hear um, in, in the media. What they also demonstrate, and which is more evident, I think, from the, um, from the research update themselves, is that attitudes are actually very nuanced. It's very difficult to find any clear patterns within the data, and this would be the value of continuing this survey. So we can't say for sure that, you know, um, young people are more accepting or less accepting of particular issues. We can't say that somebody who would support use of refuges would also support use of toilets. So there's some real nuances within the data which is completely missed in a lot of the, the media discourse in this. And this brings us to our final reason then why we should focus on the T and on what this data has generated, why it's important. For us, we think that this data actually can be very valuable. It can allow us to speak back to or to trouble some of the very powerful claims being made by particular groups or within the media about risks being posed of the extension of transgender rights. There is often assumptions made about who is accepting and who is unaccepting, who is at risk if um, rights are extended. For example, in response to the consultation and updating the Gender Recognition Act, an act in England and Wales, whereby the proposal is that individuals can self-identify their gender, so without a medical diagnosis or without having to give proof that they've been living within an acquired gender, campaigns such as this by Fair, Fair Play for a Woman have suggested that such chips such changes would, in their words, rob women and girls of their rights and that female rights and safety are under attack. So the way in which this has been spoken about often leads us to believe that women are at risk, that they need safeguarding and they may lose out. And I guess the point we're saying is that th these are based on assumptions and now what we have is some very particular data which actually lets us disaggregate to think about well, what are the views of females and males on these issues. So again, if we break down the responses by gender, we find two things that I think are really interesting. Uh, firstly, in all of those scenarios, so public access uh, to toilets, to domestic violence refuges, and the right uh, to change uh, a birth certificate, in all of the scenarios, females are more accepting than males. And actually, really interesting, alongside knowing someone who's transgender, that's the, actually the only factor that is consistently correlated with more accepting attitudes. So as I said, it's been really difficult to look in the data to say one group's more accepting of everything more generally, but actually consistently uh, females are more accepting, along with people who know someone who's transgender. And then secondly, if we look at the statistics themselves in relation to each of these scenarios, we also see that actually uh, women report high, fairly high levels of uh, comfort and acceptance. And this is particularly noticeable, I think, in relation to use of domestic violence refuges, whereby 64% of females said that they were comfortable with, comfortable with a transgender woman using a domestic violence refuge if they were experiencing domestic violence. So again, while campaigns such as those we have just illustrated may fuel public panic and concern, research like this actually shines a more robust and a scientific light on what the public actually think. So for us, these are some of the reasons why it's important that we tease out some of these issues. Overall, the data, as we said, may imply that public attitudes towards transgender people are fairly positive. What it also does when you get a chance to look at the data is it shows the nuances in attitudes and it also um, highlights to us, to us that we need to be looking at this over time, not just on uh, one incident, instance. And this is what Gail's going to talk about now a little bit. She's going to wrap up by thinking about what we've learned from doing the survey and what might be some of the ways forward. Siobhan had her five reasons why. I was hoping to do five reasons as well, but I just couldn't do it, so I've got four. Um, four, four things to think about going forward. I suppose the first thing is that we recognise that we need to ask questions that not just allow people to 
um, report on self-identified prejudice, but gets to some of the hidden prejudice that individuals might have as well. The BSA study sought to do that by asking, do you describe yourself as prejudice, followed by questions that recorded levels of acceptance to transgender people in public roles. So for example, um, as a teacher or a police officer or things like that. And questions like that might help um, well, it might be better indicators of prejudice than self-defined ratings, and we, we, we recognise that. Um, and this is particularly important, like we said at the outset, because the experiences of trans people seem to be somewhat out of sync with some of what's being presented. So perhaps some of the questions going forward um, could consider that in ways that we would get to that hidden prejudice. We feel that future research would also benefit from collaboration with the trans sector for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, kind of in framing what some of those issues might be that could be explored, and secondly, around the wording of survey questions. The language that surveys use are really important. Um, one, like we said at the start, it needs to be accessible to people, but we can also see some of the limitations of some of the definitions that are used. So there needs to be some sort of conversation around how um, we can frame questions that are accessible but get to the, the, the range of identities, and that's no easy feat. Um, um, but one that, that, that's important because actually how researchers talk and the questions that they use perhaps in part informs a public understanding of something. So if you've never really thought about something before, how a researcher asks you a question on it perhaps then becomes your way of understanding that. So that becomes really significant. Um, given the definition of trans used at the beginning uh, and the questions around diverse identities, we recognise uh, that future studies need to develop questions that would allow us to capture more fluid, non-binary identities as well um, within uh, those public surveys. And finally, despite the issues that we've flagged around definitions and some of those questions, this um, we believe is really significant in that it's the first um, uh, attitudes, pu public attitude survey um, on trans issues in Northern Ireland. The survey has collected public attitudes towards other minority and social issues over time and we've been able, as Siobhan said, to be able to go back and to track that, how have things changed or not changed with regards to some other attitudes and we, we haven't had uh, the, 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 the baseline to do that and what this survey does now is provide that baseline um, going forward that we can start to um, measure things against. Thank you. <laughs>